Okay. So, now we come back to functional method and how to compute uh, Green's functions in quantum field theory. So, we begin by introducing the vacuum to vacuum functional in QFT and uh, to that end we need the Lagrangian density. relativistic quantum mechanics which is and the <coughs> m squared will be so we can put minus epsilon by 2 phi squared plus I guess right because we want uh, uh, I I. So, at this level it is minus. So, if I multiply by I it should become minus. So, it is plus I. So, one analogy is that this is exactly analogous to the harmonic oscillator with uh, enhancement of space and time points. So, compare uh, space and time coordinates. So, compare the fact that I have d q of t only and then e raised to i integral d t and then this uh, q dot square and minus uh, the half factor is there, but half q dot square minus omega square q square. So, from this we are going to integral d the configuration space variable I call phi, but then put t x 1 x 2 x 3 and do an e raise to i and now I do a d 4 x and now I do phi dot square, but minus gradient phi square minus m square phi square. Okay. So, <coughs> instead of considering a one coordinate problem in one time direction, I consider a one coordinate problem, but as a function of four dimensional space time, but with the also with the Minkowskian metric that is the main difference. And then the analogy is complete because the omega square term looks like the mass square term and all the methods will the all the technical calculations will look identical there is not much difference. At this point I could also comment a little bit about uh, this uh, business why we put the Minkowski invariance because we want Minkowski invariant S matrix theory in the end of course. But if you go to the constructive approach of Weinberg uh, what he basically says is that uh, so, uh, remark on uh, 
So, here what we do is we start with you remember that we argued that <coughs> if you have a weakly coupled system it uh, always boils down to introducing A and A daggers corresponding to single particle uh, set of eigenvalues alpha. But now we implement the so called the word implement Poincare invariance by identifying this eigenvalue set alpha with momentum k and sigma spin ok. These are single particle uh, attributes. So, single particle momentum and single particle spin and how does that connect? Well, recall Uh, in Poincare group we have has all the j mu nu j rho sigma commutators and it also has the p mu p nu and this is equal to 0 and we also have j mu nu p rho commutators. This will this j mu nu p rho because j mu nu is rotation generator it will only rotate the p's into each other. These are the the 3D part is the usual rotation group and the others is the Lorentz boost. So, this is the full algebra this is the algebra of the Poincare group. It has uh, it has precisely two Casimir invariance. So, into so first of all, it has uh, exactly four mutually commuting observables. Which are the P's? Which become the K mu? Uh, yeah, which become k mu, but remember that this will be using only the space like k because there are two Casimir invariants. So, the if you did not have the translations, then you know that uh, there will be two observables one is the rotation uh, j 3 I mean it is equivalent to SU 2 cross SU 2. So, there will be two independent observables one you can say is your uh, th third axis rotation. But once you put in the p mu's the p mu's never leave any of the j mu nu invariant. So, the only mutually commuting observables available in Poincare group are the k mu. However, there are two Casimir invariants. Which are the two? Who knows? Hmm? One is j squared. Um, no, no, not quite. Sorry, not j squared. One is the one is sum of the p squares. this is one Casimir invariant. It will commute with everything because it is a Lorentz uh, invariant the j's will not touch it and the p's will also of course commute with it. Uh, so, this is one invariant which we call m square 
what is the other Casimir invariant for this? Anyone else knows? Hmm? It is not just spin. So, there is a 4 vector called Pauli Lubansky vector. So, it it took a long time okay it was like in mid 40s or sometime that and involved Pauli. So, you construct a W mu which is equal to epsilon mu nu rho sigma times j nu rho p sigma. Now, you remember has this been done before no ok. So, now you learn it. So, we may as well break the field theory for a bit to just recover this uh, well known facts of relativistic quantum mechanics that uh, these the one Casimir invariant comes simply from this and the other one is constructed out of this w. So, w mu w mu turns out to have magnitude m square times j into j plus 1 ok, where j is the would be Casimir invariant of only the rotations ok. The j into j plus 1 would have been there. Uh, is exactly the same as would have been there if you had not put in translations. <coughs> uh, just to explain quickly what this W, W mu is a really mysterious thing and you may wonder how the thought up of it. The point is if you look at it in the particle zone frame of reference. So, for a massive particle at least. in the rest frame p mu equal to m 0 0 right m n 0 vector. So, you choose the sigma to be 0. So, then w right. So, once we said this the sigma becomes has to be necessarily 0. Once that is 0 and you have this completely antisymmetric vector this can never be 0 right. So, it will become w i equal to epsilon i j k j j k times m. But this is our friend the angular momentum. I do not know what reasoning they used, but uh, yeah it is very clever construction yes. So, the important and really really the most important <laughs> statement at this point is that there is nothing that instructs you to put spin in quantum mechanics. A lot of people think that since Dirac equation came from special relativity and it contains spin therefore, we have spin. So, all completely wrong ideas because you can write a perfectly valid relativistic wave equation which is Klein Gordon equation. There is no spin to be seen in it ok. So, you can perfectly do relativity without any spin, but lot of people seem to think that Dirac proved that spin has to be there in relativity without spin we could not have had a relativistic wave equation completely wrong. You have perfectly valid relativistic wave equations without any spin in them. In fact, there is nowhere that you learn from within the formalism that you need to put in the so called intrinsic spin. You are forced to assume due to observations in nature that j has two parts
where L can be constructed from our postulate number 4 which said that all observables can be constructed out of the canonical ones. So L is of course constructed as R cross P but this S cannot be constructed from any canonical variable you have to take it on face value you have to put it out of your pocket okay. So not constructible out of this has to be put by hand but once you put it and there is the beautiful plus sign whatever that plus means uh, once you put it the algebra is exactly same as that of j and we know in fact that the algebra of j is complex and allows for both integer and half integer point values and so that fortunately matches what we observe in nature it allows you to introduce spin half. Uh, but that is all there is and the square of this w mu w mu will come out to be m squared times j squared and so that is the other Casimir invariant. So you have to take the other Casimir invariant and factor out the m then you get so whatever this j is in the particles own rest frame it will of course become just s. only the intrinsic spin will remain you sit at the location of the particle in its own rest frame there will be no no orbital angular momentum what remains is by definition what is spin okay. and so the other Casimir invariant has value m squared s into s plus 1 and that is what we put the auxiliary not canonically obtainable but observed in nature observable is what is spin. So in the constructive approach then it goes like this and you choose the A dagger to be like this and at this point you argue that you need to construct fields. We, why we got on to this point was this uh, this relativistically invariant difference derivatives we put because if we just went by the analogy then we should have just put the other coordinates that we introduced should also be just that square but instead we put this because we are trying to implement the Poincare group and there you impose you need to reorganize. we can show unitarity causality and Lorentz invariance. We need to assemble so recipe has sub parts <coughs> and uh, there would be some species label it could be a spinner uh, electromagnetism whatever it is okay. So but schematically we write it as sum over these alphas well we can now write k and sigma that does not matter. So a of k sigma 
and then we need to put in some u of k sigma with some Lorentz indices A. So, this A are except that they are not necessarily just a mu uh, just not just space time ones, but they could be spinner ones, but they represent the Lorentz group in the spinner rep. So, somehow it is a Lorentz. So, and <coughs> we are forced to put these are functions of x. So, the and a no? I meant to put that A outside, right. So, certainly A will be related to the value of this sigma, okay. So, sigmas will be related to It will be some other representation, but it will be a representation, but same matching it. And the recipe C is to construct interaction Hamiltonian. So, this part C is a recipe about constructing which we will see later so to be So, if you will remind me I will tell you when we get to that point, but the point is that in this way of doing things you never write the free wave equation. Lot of So, this reason why I am telling you is that historically because Dirac pulled his equation like out of the hat, it left people stunned for almost 20 years you know people could not work, they could not sleep because they thought how do we now write equations for higher spin. So, the causal statement is that yeah causality statement is that only if you assemble them like this will you get that support on the light cone right if you take their uh, bracket if you take their commutators. If you calculate their Feynman propagator only if they have been assembled in this form, 
I should not say Feynman propagator. So, actually it is the two point function you calculate their commutator that commutator will be relativistically covariant only if you have assembled them as space time fields like this with both this and its conjugate part included. Yes, so it, it, it will correctly capture this. So, these are the A by, A by themselves are just uh, uh, base, they are nuts and bolts right. In fact, Feynman is supposed to have commented somewhere how can you have a creation operator for an electron because you are violating electric charge creating charge out of the vacuum. Well, I am not anybody to correct Feynman, but it is just a calculation device it does not actually create anything. So, uh, by themselves they are rather bare, they begin to acquire a physical or uh, more compatible physical appearance only if you assemble them like this that is the statement. And uh, th th there is very beautiful reason why you uh, of how you assemble the H interaction and how the unitarity follows, but that is a much longer story and it is a different path. Right now we want, but I just wanted to say the most important remark is that this bit the so called free field theory is not required in that constructive approach because it is already solved for, you already put these quantum numbers. So, and they satisfy the and you only put the k because it is on shell the m I have erased, but we showed that there are two Casimir invariants and four mutually commuting observables out of the two Casimir invariants one is here I mean square root of the other Casimir invariant got used up in reducing from this 4 to 3 it is on shell. Okay. So, that is how these are listed. So, we exhausted all there is to this beautiful differential equation, the Klein Gordon equation, over which often half of the quantum 3 course is spent trying to tell you that it has bad interpretation, it gives you negative probabilities. All this is not really required at all, it is not part of quantum theory at all, you do not have to worry. If you start quantum theory right, this is the process. Implement classically observed symmetries on the Hilbert space by constructing the operators that have the same commutation relations as the classical ones have the Lie algebra that is the realize and with an advanced assumption that we will recover these operators out of the canonical variables of the system which we eventually do we can recover them out of the phi and pi phi and the canonical conjugates. But the point is that the free equation is already solved and there is no further content to Klein Gordon equation than imposing the energy momentum relation that is all there really is. All the rest there is is the spin content which you have to carefully construct into the construction of the functions u they are either the spinner functions or the polarization vectors of the electromagnetic you know epsilon polarized. So, that that is and of course, e raise to i k which is solution of that. So, already built in. So, the free theory is already solved there is nothing to be done about it and that is where we have a bit of a contrast because here the free propagator appears and it has the free wave equation and you uh, etcetera. Uh, so, for the quantized field all everything goes through exactly as before. So, I can hurry up a little bit and say that therefore, we write the W of j now. Now, we switch to the notation j current it will be equal to W 0 times e raise to minus i over 2 integral of well and the same notation j 1 uh, <coughs> delta f now 
delta f12 j2 where so and then we get So, delta Feynman 1 2 Okay, so let us just uh, specify how this is with respect to the Klein Gordon equation. It is equal to d mu d mu minus m squared delta f equal to minus delta 4. sign is not right is not it box plus m square I have to write because box in my definition is dt square minus dx squared. So, dx square will minus dx square will give plus p squared. So, it should so it should because of the i it will act on e raise to i omega. So, because of the i's, so I have to put a plus m square here, which is probably required here also. So, so far so good and as a trailer of next time, let me tell you that if you now do the same trick, right? yes, yeah, so anyway, so long as these signs remain the same, it is fine. If you now use your machinery of varying with respect to external current, often people put this 2 because you go to endpoint functions. W. Evaluated at j equal to zero, you will find Feynman propagator here, and for if you do it for g four, so you will find that the odd ones are always vanishing, because remember that after differentiation you have to set j equal to 0. So, if you differentiate and this expression is quadratic in j, 
j and j. So if you have varied j once, this thing would have come down from the exponent with a j sitting in front. So it will become 0 when you set j equal to 0. So only the even uh, numbered Green's functions are non-zero and if you try to do this, it will become factored into delta f 1, 2, delta f 3, 4, so x 1, x 2, x 3, x 4. but plus alternatives so the uh, I mean you can just check next time we'll check it in more detail next time so the four point function will just boil down to a sum of terms each of which is again product of pairwise two point functions. And this is how eventually the particle interpretation emerges because you always have these two point functions appearing everywhere. So it is something propagating from one point to the other. You can draw, join, draw the Feynman propagator as a line. And, uh, so eventually that is those are the building blocks. So the building blocks of Green's functions eventually are these ticks and blobs which are vertices. That is what we will show in the next one or two lectures. <laughs>